If there's one thing Bioware absolutely nailed in the early days of Dragon Age, it's the balance between making a character likable and making them interesting. And when I say interesting, I don't mean making them squeaky clean, perfect or all around good in the eyes of the player. That's the easy way out. And frankly, it's kind of boring. No one wants a cast of flawless saints. What makes this character stand out is when you take a step back and realize, objectively speaking, they might not be good people, but there's something so much deeper going on beneath the surface. Let's be clear, Bioware didn't make a bunch of heroes. They made people with flaws, insecurities, and motivations that are as messy and unpredictable as the world they inhabit. And in my opinion, the beauty of this storytelling is that it invites you to understand these characters. Sure, you may not agree with them or condone their actions, but once you see the layers behind their decisions, you can't help but appreciate the complexity. Take Morrigan from Origins, for example. On the surface, she's cold, calculating, and manipulative. Her motivations? Not exactly the stuff of noble quests. She is driven by a fear of being controlled, a desire for independence, and let's face it, some pretty raw emotional baggage. Now, if Bioware had watered her down to just another mysterious mage, she'd be nothing more than a shadow of what she is. But they didn't do that. Instead, they let us see the cracks beneath her heart and exterior, her vulnerability, her fear, and ultimately, her need for connection. The beauty of Morrigan isn't that she's a flawless character, is that she's a deeply flawed, emotionally complicated person who just happens to be on a very different path from the other characters. That's what makes her human, and it's why we care for her, even when we don't always agree with her methods. This is where a lot of Velgar companions fall short. When you try to make every character a good person in the most basic, idealized sense, you lose that complexity. You miss the opportunity to show how someone's darker traits, like ambition, selfishness, or even cruelty, can be tied to something deeper, like insecurity, trauma, or survival. And here's the kicker. Those flaws don't always have to be fixed or resolved. Sometimes, just understanding them is enough to change how we see a character. Take a character like Varric, for example. He's not a saint, but we love him anyways. He's cynical, self-serving at times, and let's face it, can be pretty manipulative when he wants to be. But Varric's charm lies in his ability to navigate these traits in ways that makes him relatable. He's got a good heart under all the sarcasm, and his friendships feel real because they're grounded in mutual understanding, not just a shared sense of righteousness. We know he's not perfect, and that's what makes him so much more fun to spend time with. The key takeaway here is that when characters are allowed to be messy, when they're given room to exist in a moral gray area, it makes the whole experience more real. It's not about making them good or bad, it's about making them feel authentic. And Bioware, for all their ups and downs, managed to do this so well in Origins. They made us understand, even sympathize with, characters who weren't always easy to love. And honestly, that's the magic of storytelling. But with Veilguard, we didn't quite get that same feeling, did we? Companions are watered down to their basic, most palatable forms. The Canary Warrior, the Tevinter Detective, the Quirky Daily's Mage, the Tapper Necromancer. In Velgar, characters are just the sum of their parts. What you see is what you get, and the moment you try to dig a little deeper, you realize there's nothing to uncover. No hidden layers, no moral gray areas, just surface-level traits that feel more like checkbox requirements than actual character development. The problem here is that these characters don't feel like people. They feel like archetypes, generic, cookie-cutter personalities with a few buzzwords attached to make them seem unique. Oh, one struggles with their gender identity. That's an important issue, no doubt about it. But is it explored in a way that resonates with the player? Not really. It's just a thing they say they're dealing with without showing how it affects them in meaningful ways. Another one wants to be useful? That's a relatable desire. But again, how is it explored? It's just mentioned, not examined. One blames herself for something that wasn't her fault? Sure, it's a good starting point for a character arc. But when that's all you've got, it's not enough to make a character feel alive. And don't get me started on the one who's afraid of getting old. That's the kind of flaw that feels more like a punchline than a genuine emotional struggle. Look, these are valid concerns. They're human struggles, absolutely. But in a dark fantasy RPG, 
they need to be more than just surface level traits. In Dragon Age, we got characters who were grappling with huge, life-altering issues. Characters like Morrigan, who was dealing with the weight of her mother's legacy and the path that was forced upon her. Or Alistair, who was fighting against his own insecurities about being a king. These weren't just things they felt. These were things that defined their journeys, their actions, and their growth over the course of the game. In Velgor, though, it feels like these characters are stuck in the same emotional space. Their arcs are static, their growth is minimal, and their conflicts are more like roadblocks that don't feel earned. It's like Bioware tried to check the box for diversity and inclusion without actually giving these characters the depth to back it up. Instead of evolving as real people, they remain frozen in time reduced to nothing more than a handful of traits that you can't help but feel are more for the player's benefit than the character's journey. Today we're going to talk about one of these characters, and perhaps one of the worst offenders, considering he has every single ingredient to become a complex, compelling character, and somehow they managed to make him the most boring out of all of them. Lucanis de la Morte an Antivan Crow, a man so infamous in his quest to hand down Venatorian blood mages that it earned him the moniker the Demon of Virantium, next apparent heir of House de la Morte and future first town of the Crows, a man who was experimented on by blood magic and had a demon of spite implanted in him. On paper, Lucani seems to be one of the most interesting characters we've come across so far in the history of Dragon Age, right? Wrong. Even though Lucanis has the most established lore out of the new Velgar companions, he somehow is written in a way that makes him… lame. What's key here is that Lucanis has this rich backstory, filled with dark elements, his connection to the crows, the tragedy of being experimented on, the demon living inside him. But when we meet him in Velgar, it feels like none of it sticks. Instead of feeling like a broken, complex character, he comes across as… Well, kind of safe. He's the guy who wants to be good, the guy who wants to fight against the demon inside him, but we don't get to see him struggle with it in a meaningful way. We know he's possessed by a demon of spite, but his actual personality feels hollow, and worst of all, he doesn't seem affected by it. He's not brooding, he's not torn between his own will and the demon's influence, he's just… fine. The demon of Virantium? More like the guy who just wants a coffee. Lucanus's emotional conflict should have been a huge part of his character arc, but instead we're given a guy who seems more like he's going along for the ride rather than battling internal demons, literally. The potential for a complex journey, torn between his duty as a crow and the chaos of the demon inside him, gets lost because the game never lets him truly wrestle with his situation. Instead, we get a version of Lucanis who's kind and safe and almost annoyingly well-meaning, which is the complete opposite of what we were promised. Even in the books and short stories, Lucanis is portrayed as a man who would risk everything to do what he believes is right. Again, it's not a bad quality to have, far from it, but when you juxtapose this with a character who canonically makes threats about killing people over coffee, something doesn't quite add up. There's a disconnect in his characterization, a clash between extremes that never gets resolved. The writers try to make Lucanis both a ruthless, intimidating assassin, someone who gets the job done no matter the cost, and a warm, caring individual who's willing to go out of his way to shop for people in the middle of an apocalypse. Both of these elements could theoretically coexist, but the execution falls short. Let's break it down. Lucanis has been through hell, he's been betrayed, locked in a venatory prison for over a year, tortured, experimented on, and turned into an abomination. And the first moment we meet him in Velgard should have reflected that pain and betrayal. But instead, the game hands us a character who's ready to leap into action with a sense of duty and a desire to protect others, which doesn't mesh well with the gravity of his traumatic past. Sure, Lucanis may still have some core values, but the fact that he's just fine after all of that doesn't make sense. How are we supposed to believe in the death of his pain when the game barely let us see it? By the time we break him out of prison, Lucanis discovers that his own grandmother has been killed by the same woman who turned him into a monster. 
The natural response to this revelation should be one of anger, betrayal, and grief. Instead, we get a Lucanus who's a little sad about it, but not devastated. His immediate concern isn't avenging his grandmother or confronting the person who tortured him. It's making sure everyone is comfortable and feeling good about the mission. This is where the issue becomes glaring. The character's backstory demands a much harsher reaction. At the very least, Lucani should have been jaded, distrustful, and emotionally closed off from others in the beginning. That would have made his eventual transformation all the more compelling. The potential for a character arc here is so strong. A man who's been broken down by life, betrayed by the people he trusted, and experimented on to the point of becoming an abomination. You would have to chip away at the layers of emotional armor he's built, slowly earning his trust and in the process, discovering the man he used to be, a good man, forced into a life of violence. That emotional journey would be a gripping experience for the player. But instead of making us work for that connection, Belgard simply tells us, Lucanus is a good guy, he's loyal, he's soft and he's kind. It's all laid out for us, and we're expected to accept it without question. There's no room for growth, no real struggle, and no opportunity for us to truly understand the man beneath the surface. We're just told he's a tragic hero with a tragic past. But the game never allows us to feel the tragedy firsthand. Lucanus becomes a static character, someone who's been given all the right elements to be compelling, but never actually feels real in his complexity. And that's the crux of the problem. Without the death, the messiness, and the hard-earned character growth, Luganis ends up feeling like a missed opportunity. He's the perfect example of a character who should be rich with conflict and emotional death, but who ultimately falls flat because the story never makes us feel it. When I first met Lucanis, I couldn't help but think of two other characters with similar backgrounds and traits, Severin and Anders. Both of these characters, like Lucanis, have dark pasts, Severin, the ex-assassin of the Antivan Crows, and Anders, a mage turned abomination, both burdened with the weight of their painful histories. These characters were more than just their titles or their backstories. They were complex, deeply flawed individuals, each dealing with their trauma in their own way. And in their own unique styles, both Severin and Anders managed to be two of the most unforgettable compelling characters in the Dragon Age franchise. But Lucanus? Lucanus is essentially a blend of these two characters, a fusion of the ruthless, morally ambiguous assassin and the torture emotional abomination. Yet he somehow fails to deliver on either front. Where Severin's charm was in his wit and cynicism, and Anders's pain was rooted in his struggle for justice and redemption, Lucanus feels more like an attempt to hit all the right notes without ever truly finding the melody. The thing about Severin and Anders is that they're defined by their flaws. Their trauma doesn't just define their past, it defines how they interact with the world, how they form relationships, and ultimately, how they grow throughout their respective stories. Severin is not just a charming rogue, he's someone who's been used, betrayed, and shaped by the crows, and his actions are informed by that pain. Anders, too, isn't just a mage struggling with the fact that he's possessed by a spirit. His personal conflict is tied directly to his moral compass and the decisions he makes in an unjust world. Lucanus, on the other hand, feels more like a deus ex machina, a character introduced to serve a function, but whose complexity and internal conflict are sidelined in favor of moving the plot forward. Instead of diving deep into his psyche and giving us a true understanding of his struggles, the game just hands us a man who's been through hell, but is somehow still pleasant, soft, and eager to please. It's as though Lucanus was built to fit a character archetype, but never really allowed to become someone more than that. He's not just a crow assassin or a torture abomination, he's supposed to be a unique character with his own internal journey, but his arc is never fully realized. Severin R&I stands as a testament to the power of a well-crafted character arc, one that transcends the familiar trope of the charming flirty rogue. When players first meet Severin, he's introduced as a man who's not only an assassin, but also a man who has long since stopped caring about life itself. He accepts the contract on the hero of Freldon's life because, frankly, he expects to die. He's spent so many years walking the razor's edge between life and death, forced to kill without remorse for the infamous Antiban crows, 
that he's lost the will to fight for anything. But behind that flippant demeanor and flirtatious smile, Severn is far more than just a charming rogue. He's a survivor with a dark, complicated past. Severn's backstory is one of the most tragic in Dragon Age. The son of a prostitute who died giving birth to him, Severn's childhood was anything but normal. Raised in a brothel, he was exposed to hardship and brutality from a very young age. He had to steal to survive just to make it through each day. His life was one of survival, and he learned quickly that in the world of the crows, there was no room for weakness or sentimentality. Severin's transformation from an innocent boy to a deadly assassin was not one he chose. It was forced upon him. The crows took him, molded him into a weapon, and removed all traces of humanity until he was little more than a killer for hire. But despite all of that, Severin's heart wasn't completely lost. He's a man haunted by his past, by the people he's had to kill, and by the constant tug of war between the assassin he was trained to be and the person he still wants to be deep down. When Severin reflects on his life, it's not with the satisfaction of someone who's part of their deeds. Rather, it's with regret and bitterness. He talks about the two people he ever truly cared about, Rin and Taliesin, both of whom he was forced to kill. These deaths weighed on him, not just because of the sorrow of losing loved ones, but because they were a constant reminder of how the crows twisted him into something unrecognizable. For all his cynicism and self-deprecating humor, Severn is a man who has been broken and rebuilt too many times, and that emotional toll is one he carries with him constantly. Where Lycanis fails to show us the death of his pain, Severn thrives. Even in the darkest moments of his past, we see the traces of the man he could have been, had circumstances been different. And that's what makes Severn so compelling. He's not just defined by the dark things he's done, he's defined by his attempts to overcome them. After the events of Origins and the defeat of the Archdemon, Severn dedicates his life to hunting down the Crows, the very organization that turned him into a killer. This isn't just about revenge, it's about redemption. It's about making amends for the countless life he's taken. Severin doesn't want to just end the crow's reign of terror, he wants to make sure that no one else has to go through what he did. What makes Severin such a standout character is that he doesn't let his past dictate his future. He's a character who, despite everything he's been through, still manages to show vulnerability and kindness. His journey from an assassin with no care for life to someone willing to fight for a better world is one of the most poignant character arcs in Dragon Age. Severin may have started out as a jaded killer, but over time, he learns that even someone like him, someone who has been broken and remade, can still find a path towards healing. In contrast to Lucanis, Severance's arc feels earned. We see him struggle, we see him fail, and we see him triumph. His growth is not handed to us. It's something we experience alongside him. And that's the difference. Severance's story isn't about a good guy in disguise. It's about a man trying to make peace with the terrible things he's done and trying to find a way to live with honor, despite it all. He's a man who has crawled his way from the bottom and despite all odds, found a way to reclaim his humanity. Severin is a deeply flawed, complex character. He's not a perfect hero, but that's what makes him so real. He's a reminder that even in the darkest corners of the world, there's still room for redemption. Anders is a character defined by loss, sacrifice, and the slow burn of resentment that shapes every aspect of his being. Unlike Lucanus, whose internal conflict hinges on his possession by a demon of spite, Anders' transformation into an abomination is tied to his long-standing trauma and the heartbreaking reality of his life as a mage in Theras. At his core, Anders is a man who has experienced the worst that Theras has to offer, and his evolution into a champion for mage freedom is both a testament to his enduring pain and a reflection of his inability to truly let go of his past. Anders' story begins with the most devastating of betrayals, his father's decision to call the Templars on him the moment his magic manifested. The action of a father who, in a society so fearful of mages, chooses the safety of the status quo over his own son's well-being. That initial rejection marks the beginning of a lifelong struggle for Anders, whose identity becomes forever shaped by the oppressive institutions of the Circle and the Templars. His true name, his identity, becomes something he cannot remember, erased by the very system that seeks to control him, all of this before he even begins his journey as a mage. The trauma Anders endures in the Circle would be enough to break most people, 
but he feels a deep smoldering rage inside him. His experience in the circle is one of confinement, fear, and imaginable loss. Magic for Anders has never been a gift, but a curse, something that always makes him a target. He loses his first love, a fellow mage, to the very system that oppressed him, reinforcing his deep belief that mages cannot be free so long as the Templars and the Chantry control them. When we meet Anders in Dragon Age 2, he has become an advocate for the freedom of mages, though this is not a mission born out of hope, but out of a desire for vengeance against the world that has crushed him. He has been on the run for years, moving from one place to another, always pursued by the Templars. He has seen and experienced the worst of what the world can offer mages, and his bitterness runs deep. Anders has suffered too much to be naive about the world. His experiences have hardened him into a man who values his freedom above all else. His connection with justice, a spirit of justice that is initially sought to help the oppressed, is what pushes Anders down the path of becoming an abomination. In many ways, justice's transformation into vengeance mirrors Anders' own evolution into a man driven by anger, guilt, and a desperate desire to force change by any means necessary. But unlike Lucanus's relationship with Spite, where Spite is a demon of purely destructive intent, Justice's transformation into vengeance is driven by Anders' own emotional turmoil. In the beginning, Justice was a spirit who desired balance and righteousness, a spirit who wanted to help the oppressed. By Anders' rage, his guilt over the death of his love and his inability to save anyone twists Justice's purpose into something darker. Justice becomes a demon of vengeance, consumed by the idea that mages must strike back at the system that has oppressed them for so long. This shift is subtle at first, but by the time Anders embraces this new purpose, it's clear that both he and Justice are no longer the same. Anders' anger is not just at the Templars, it's at the world that created this system, at the forces that keep him and his fellow mages in chains. It's a bitterness that has hardened into pride. He makes no attempt to hide his feelings, no attempt to mask the deep disdain he has for the institutions of power that have shaped his life. But this pride, while it fuels his movement, also makes him deeply flawed. Anders is not a perfect advocate for mage freedom. His methods, his pride, and his anger often gets in the way of his good intentions. His radicalism, while rooted in the right cause, blinds him to the potential consequences of his actions. His tragic flaw is that he never truly heals from the trauma of his past. Unlike Severan, who uses his pain to fuel a desire for redemption, Anders' rage consumes him. It drives him to actions that, in the end, may cause more harm than good. His attempt to create change is admirable, but his methods, becoming an abomination using radical force, reveal the destructive side of his personality. Anders is a man who has never had the chance to be whole. His identity is a fracture thin, held together only by his desire for vengeance. He's not a man at peace with the world, nor with himself. He's a man who is constantly fighting, constantly on the run, forever struggling to make a better world for his people without ever letting go of the pain that drives him. In the end, Anders is one of Dragon Age's most tragic characters, not because he fails, but because he's so deeply, irreversibly scarred. His journey is one of redemption gone wrong, a tale of a man who was too broken to save, even by his own hands. Lucas' story falls short of its potential precisely because it doesn't explore the complexities that could make him a character people can truly connect with. His character, while designed to be the edgy, conflicted assassin archetype, ultimately feels one-dimensional. There's more to a compelling character than just being cool or edgy. These traits don't sustain interest if there's nothing underneath to make them human, relatable, or flawed. Compare this to characters like Severin and Anders, who both share a history of violence and trauma, but their character arcs are enriched by how they confront and grapple with their darkness. They are born in the darkness in different ways, and the way they navigate this internal struggle is what makes them compelling. Lucanus' character, on the other hand, feels incomplete because we never see him truly struggle with his past or the darkness within him. While it's clear he's been through a lot, betrayed, tortured, experimented on, he doesn't feel earned. His transformation from a cold, calculating assassin to someone who's suddenly aware of the preferences of everyone around him feels too abrupt. He doesn't feel like a gradual change based on the trauma he's endured. 
Instead, it's as if the narrative is telling us that he's a good guy at his core and we're just supposed to accept that. Lucanus is told to be a good person, but we never really see him earn that goodness or work through the trauma that should define him. This lack of death makes his character feel unearned and ultimately unrelatable. A character who has been through the things Lucanus has endured should be more complex, with layers of anger, distress, and vulnerability. But because the narrative skips over these layers and presents him as a good guy without addressing his flaws, Lucanus comes across as more of a cipher than a fully realized character. The reason Severin and Anders resonate with players is because of their flaws. They are not perfect, far from it. Severin is a man shaped by trauma, and his willingness to let people in is something earned over time, especially as he confronts his past. Anders is filled with rage and pain, he still has the desire to make the world a better place, even if it's at the cost of his own well-being. Their imperfections, their darkness, and their internal struggles make them feel real. They're products of their environments, yes, but they also have the agency to change, whether or not they succeed in doing so. Lucanus, in contrast, doesn't give the audience the chance to explore his complexity. He's a victim of his circumstances, but we're not shown the internal process that would make his eventual softness or loyalty feel like an earned transformation. We are told that Lucanus has been hurt, that he's soft on the inside, but without an exploration of what that means for him, what those experiences have done to his psyche, he feels like a flat character arc. Characters who are good at everything, with no real flaws or struggles, are hard to connect with because they don't feel authentic. It's not about making a character edgy or cool, it's about showing the human side of them. We want to see them make mistakes, confront their demons, and ultimately learn something about themselves. The most compelling characters in Dragon Age are those who face their darkness head on, and through the struggle find a way to rise above it, or at least attempt to. If Lucanus had been given the opportunity to truly adopt the darkness, to wrestle with his trauma and question his own morality, he could have been a character as nuanced as Severin and Anders. Instead, his journey feels too easy, as though we are expected to care about him without ever seeing the struggle that would make him worth caring for. And in a world like Dragon Age, where darkness is so prevalent and every character has their own demons to face, Lucanus' simplicity makes him fall flat against the more complex characters who define the series. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time when we'll dive into more of Dragon Age lore that's both fascinating and frustrating. Until then, stay critical, stay curious, and as always, stay gaming.